Hello and hello. Not many joiners today, but we, we fully plan on finishing off fitting methods. Well, we may get, maybe we not, won't get to the very end of it and we'll just continue on it next week, but nonetheless, anyway, we'll go as far as we can. We also, I'm told we have a lab on the 24th on uh, Friday, I believe. And I'll be joining uh, the lab as well, talking about real ear measurement, fitting methods and real ear, and always tying the two together because they are inextricably connected. Last week, and I'll, I'll start sharing screen here and show some of the notes where we were last week. And uh, see if I can get to that. All right, here's our notes. Last week, we started on fitting methods, and we moved on down the page. We talked about why we have so many darn fitting methods in the first place, and here we highlighted the difference between optometry versus audiology or audiometry. So there's a real difference, and that difference, of course, lies in the kind of damage done to the, to the eye versus the ear. Most vision loss is conductive vision loss. Most hearing loss is sensory neural. And that's why we have so many different fitting methods in hearing. And that's why we don't have that same situation with uh, vision. Moving down the page, looking at mirroring the audiogram with full on gain. And that's really when we kind of looked at this slide here, didn't we? We looked at this slide here and could see that we really can't fix this whole threshold loss by making it all zero. Because if we did that with a hearing aid, okay, I mean, we can do that for really soft sounds. Look at my cursor here on the bottom right. If all the input sounds were 5 dB, sure, we could amplify all of those by the full degree of the loss and thus make those five decibel sounds all audible. But we really stressed last week that we can't do that with speech because with speech, the input level is already 55 dBHL or 65 dBSPL. And if we amplified that input by the full degree of the lost, well, we'd be blasting the person to kingdom come. And so we really had to move on and stress that we've got to amplify soft sounds by a lot, average sounds by less and loud sounds by little or nothing at all. And we really stressed last week how that was all due to the dynamic range, the reduced dynamic range of the listener. Looking at this high frequency loss on the left and now turning this all into dBSPL, and we called this bottom blue curve minimal audible pressure, really that's zero dBHL, isn't it? Okay, and the hearing threshold for one ear under a headphone. And you can see how this person's floor is elevated. <clears throat> and his ceiling is left the same, but his floor is elevated. So the red curves show his reduced dynamic range compared to the larger dynamic range. And again, this slide showing the same thing. Normal dynamic range on the left, reduced dynamic range on the right. And notice how the ceiling hasn't changed. What's changed is that the floor is raised. The person can't hear soft sounds. And looking at it yet again another way, looking at the audiogram with a large dynamic range, and this audiogram showing a reduced dynamic range. And again, the uncomfortable loudness level hasn't really changed all that much. What's changed is the floor. And yeah, it is kind of weird on the audiogram. The floor <laughs> is actually on the top. And that's why the audiogram could be called the audiogram, O-D-D-I-O-G-R-A-M. Anyway, in the old days, and those days were all that long ago, 20-some years ago, okay, hearing aids were linear, and that's meant that they gave the same gain at all input levels, okay? And now when you take linear hearing aids and you put them with sensory neural hearing loss, you've got the necessity for the half gain fitting method. And we said that all the, the half gain rule based by Liebarger, it's the spinal cord of all fitting methods today, didn't we? And we said that the way that they measured or verified 
these half game methods because they realized that they could only improve the hearing thresholds by half the degree of the hearing loss. Remember this, okay? And they, they would have the person tested under headphones and that would give this audiogram, for example. Then they would take off the headphones, plug up one ear and put a hearing aid in the other ear and they'd retest the thresholds in a sound field, hoping that the aided thresholds would be lifted by half. And the reason why is because then with input speech, that's 55 dBHL or 65 dBSPL. That input speech plus half the gain would nicely place aided speech output within the dynamic range of the hearing impaired person without exceeding his loudness discomfort levels. If they had raised these thresholds all the way to zero and made the A's all at zero, then input speech of 55 dBHL or 65 dBSPL plus the full on gain of the hearing aid that way would blast this person to kingdom come. An aided speech output would be sitting down at his loudness discomfort levels. Can't do that. And then we said that real ear came into the picture in the late 1980s, early 1990s. And the idea was to take the real unaided ear canal response of the listening person. And then they would take the hearing aid and put it in on top of the probe tube that was inserted in this guy's ear canal. So they would put the probe tube inside the ear canal, measure his unaided open ear canal resonance with a tone going brrr, brrr, and then they would pay, take the hearing aid, put it at a comfortable volume control level and place it carefully on the tube and they would see the real aided ear real ear aided response and their aided minus the unaided would give you the real ear insertion gain and we determine how close that was to the target established by the fitting method and if it was the half gain rule used then this target would show half the degree of the hearing loss and you'd see how closely the hearing aid matched that target now we stressed last week that real ear didn't the fitting method may not have changed. In other words, looking at this target here, that red, you'll see exactly the same values there as you'll see in the previous slide where the A's are. Okay? So this might be the target where you would want your, tar your aided thresholds to be when you used functional gain, which was raising a hand when you heard the tone under headphones, and then raising a hand when you heard the tone with the hearing aid on in a sound field, and comparing the two thresholds. Functional gain, and your target may have been half the degree of the loss. Well, now you're talking insertion gain with real ear. And again, you might be looking at half the degree of the loss, if your fitting method was the half gain rule. Okay, so the fitting method didn't change. What changed was the method whereby you verified or proved that the, the fitting method was matched. Okay, and then we said that we had four children of the half gain method, and <clears throat> the first one was Burger, and then the next one was Pogo, okay, and then the next one was Libby, and then the next one was Now. Okay, so going quickly back over, I'll just say that POGO, I should say burger, half gain rule method, okay, it loved 2000 hertz. It amplified the crap out of 2000 hertz. It also really liked 3000 hertz. You can see that the, the, the amount of by which it would lift the, the thresholds was more than half gain. It wasn't 0.5. It's 0 .6, 0 0.625, and at 2,000 hertz, 0 0.667, okay? So it's a variation of the half gain rule, but it asks for a little bit more than half gain at 2,000 and 3,000 hertz, and a little bit less than half gain at, let's say, 250 hertz, okay? Then we went to... And, it look, and I explained that rationale because when you're looking at unaided speech, 
most, and there's exactly a hundred dots on this screen, and where each dot represents 1% of the aided response that's necessary to understand what was said, most cues are found at 2,000 hertz, 2 to 3,000 hertz. So if each dot here of 100 represents 1% of audibility required to understand what was said, it's the high frequency consonants. And that's why Berger placed so much emphasis at 2 and 3,000 hertz. Pogo also did that, but Pogo prescribed a little bit less than half gain, especially for the lows. It was really, it, 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 it really, it basically gave half gain at all frequencies. It didn't emphasize quite as much at two and three as Berger did, but it still gave quite a bit of gain. It gave half gain at high frequencies, but less than half gain for the low frequencies. And we said that was because of the upward spread of masking. Remember that? And I think that's where I showed you these weird kite-shaped things just to bug you. I'll stop sharing here. And I showed you these weird kite-shaped things, and we talked about the upward spread of masking, okay? Nonetheless, back to shared screen again so you don't have to look at me, okay? So now we're going over to the third method, and that would be Libby. And I have a little bit of problem sometimes. Here we go. Ah, good thing the screen didn't stick that time. It happens with Zoom. Sometimes when I'm showing real ear, my screen sticks and I can't advance very well. But hey, here we go. So Libby, the third fitting method, was interesting because it divided sensory neural loss into its two main camps, didn't it? Sensory hearing loss and neural hearing loss. Sensory loss being outer hair cell caused loss, which is going to be mild to moderate with decent speech discrimination, and neural hearing loss being more inner hair cell damage caused. Okay, and outer hair cell damage tends to precede inner hair cell damage. So usually when you've got inner hair cell damage, you've got more of a severe hearing loss. The outers have died and now some inners have gone as well. So now you've got a more severe loss. And Libby said, hey, you know, people with a sensory mild to moderate loss, they tend to like one third gain. They don't want as much amplification. Whereas people with more severe loss, okay, they want more than half gain. Interesting, yeah, very just an interesting observation. And then we get to now. And now, now we're gonna and we'll now we're gonna focus on now because that's a very popular fitting method and still is used today. Only it's a compression-based method today. So the original now, look at your speech sounds on the audiogram. Notice how the vowels are louder and lower. And as you get to these high frequency unvoiced consonants, those are softer and higher. Well, now says, even though that's the way normal hearing people hear speech, we really don't care. When we aid speech, we're going to aid speech so that all adjacent speech frequencies contribute equally to its overall loudness. And that's what sets NAL apart among fitting methods. So later on, NAL was revised. And that's why you always saw NAL R. And what did they base that on? They based that on this slide here. Pretend someone has no hearing loss. Look at the zero. Okay? No hearing loss. Well then, how much do the low frequencies need to be reduced in order to make them sound equally loud to the higher frequencies? And now said, oh, you gotta reduce them by a lot. Now R said, yeah, they've gotta be reduced, but by not quite as much. Okay, so whereas the original now would really prescribe, would really back off from giving low frequency gain. Now R said, ah, you're, you're, you're protesting too much. Give a little bit more 
low frequency gain. Yeah, the low frequency vowels are louder than the high frequency vowel, the high frequency consonants, but you don't need to reduce their intensity by 30 dB, maybe just reduce their intensity by 20 dB in order to make them sound equally loud. And so that brings us really to how now R got calculated. How were the targets for now calculated? And basically, they were done by three things added together. You always took the pure person's pure tone average at 5, 1, and 2,000 hertz, and you multiplied that by 0.05 or divided by 20, same thing. Or, and then you took the person's individual thresholds across the audiogram, and you divided those by three or multiplied them by 0.31. And then a third thing was you took different values at each frequency that made each adjacent speech frequencies sound equally loud. Okay, so here you go. How, what, but how much did you have to reduce the lows in order to make them sound equally loud as the high frequency consonants? What was the changes you needed to make across the frequencies of speech in order to make all adjacent speech frequencies sound equally loud? Da, 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 da. And this was the formula given by now. So for, to get the target for any particular hearing loss, now took one plus two plus three, and that came up with the target. And that's how they calculated them. And then we finished last week by saying, look at this loss over here. And now look at the four fitting methods we're talking about. And look at the differences in the targets for this one particular hearing loss. Optometry doesn't have that. We do. Okay, why? Because our loss is sensory neural. That's why. If all hearing loss was conductive, we wouldn't have that problem. Same with for a more precipitous hearing loss. Look at the differences among the targets of the four fitting methods. And then for a sloping loss like this, again, look at the differences. Okay, so it's just giving you three different examples of how these things differed. Then behind the scene, realier measures emerged Imperative to keep in mind, the fitting method targets didn't change, just the measurement changed. And again, we highlight what real ear did, insertion gain versus functional gain. Instead of behavioral functional gain, we now use insertion gain, or that's what the early real ear did. And real ear was non-behavioral. It didn't ask the person to raise a hand. It just measured the aided versus unaided SPL at the tympanic membrane. Okay, note the fitting methods themselves didn't change. In other words, the target, the targets didn't change, just the method of verifying whether you hit the targets was the, was the, the idea, okay? So here's, here's a hearing loss going down on your left, as you can see with my cursor, and here might be your aided hearing levels. This might be your target for aided thresholds using functional gain on the left, A. And B, when real ear came into the picture, your targets were shown by insertion gain. And this might be your target. Notice the numbers are, are identical for both sides. It's just that the left is using behavioral functional gain, whereas the right is using insertion gain. And we will look much more at early real ear next week and the week after. So we'll get more into a description thereof later on. We want to finish off fitting methods today. At any rate, the whole idea was to match target. Here's a hearing loss. Here might be your target insertion gain. And here might be what you're actually getting with the hearing aid. Ooh, not good enough. Better raise the highs getting a little too much at the mids, okay? So again, the previous slide is just showing you the target for fitting method, for the fitting method in question. Could be burger, could be pogo, could be half gain, who cares, okay? But this would be your target and you'd verify that with functional gain. Here would be your target shown by early real ear and it's called insertion gain. And the, num the fitting method may be identical, and that's why the numbers are identical. Your goal is to see whether you hit the target or not. Did you or not? And then you adjusted the hearing aid until you did. 
Now, in the early days of real ear measurement, we looked lots at outer ear canal resonance. And we said outer ear canal resonance is due to the fact that the outer ear is a quarter wave resonator. And a quarter wave resonator is simply shown as a cup. And if I stop sharing screen here, because this is important, here's a cup, my OTC coffee mug. And the outer ear canal is like a cup. It's open at one end, it's closed at the other end. And how long is it? Two and a half centimeters. How long is two and a half centimeters? One inch. So what's it going to resonate best with? Sound waves that are four times its length. Sound waves that are 10 centimeters, because 2.5 times 4 is 10, or a sound wave that's 4 inches long, okay, whichever. Okay, 10 centimeters is about 4 inches. Same thing, either way. Wavelength is speed of sound over the frequency. Frequency is speed of sound over the wavelength. Frequency is 340 meters per second divided by the wavelength. Frequency is speed of sound, 340 meters per second, divided by 10 centimeters. And what's 10 centimeters? We've got to make the top, 340 is in meters, so we've got to make the bottom in meters. You've got to be apples and oranges. I can't have apples and oranges. Okay, this is simple grade 6 arithmetic. So 340 meters per second divided by 0.1 meters, because 10 centimeters is 0.1 meter. A meter has 100 centimeters, okay? Or you do 1130 feet per second, that's the speed of sound, divided by four inches. Oh, but you gotta make inches and feet, you gotta make them the same language, okay? 1130 feet per second divided by 0.3 feet, because four inches out of 12, you got 12 inches, what's, 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 uh, it's about a third. Okay, so then you'd have to divide and you'd, you'd get your frequency. Or you, so you, once you, you do it either in meters or you do it in feet, and you're going to end up with something pretty close to about 3,000 hertz. And looky, looky, there's the ear canal resonance centered around 2,700 hertz. Spread out a bit because the ear canal is not a cup made out of glass. It's made out of flesh and bone, and so the resonance is a bit spread out, but this is the natural, open, unaided ear canal resonance, offering us the gift of about 20 decibels lift for those high-frequency consonants. And there you have it. So now, I'm, because I'm good old, because this is Zoom, I get stuck with my uh, real ear. I guess we'll just kind of move on for a second because my, uh, my PowerPoint is stuck there. It won't move. I'll have to just kind of wait a while. Let's just move on down the slide and get to today's coverage. So we've got all the way down now, and we are down to the DSL fitting method. The DSL fitting method really changed things. Okay. Da 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 da. Here we go. A tale of two fitting methods. DSL on the left, now on the right. DSL was invented in Canada. Big pink country on the globe. Okay, where I'm sitting right now, in Canada. Now comes out of Australia, another big pink country on the globe. Both are British Commonwealth countries. Now from the land down under, and DSL from Canada, eh? All right, so there you go. I'm going to talk about DSL first. DSL first. Okay, now next. You may wonder what the previous slides that I glossed over quickly are all about. This, here's your outer ear canal resonance. Here is the outer ear canal resonance in detail. Okay, here's the res number five. That's your outer ear canal resonance just by itself. Number three is showing the resonance of your conchable. 
And when you add everything together by putting a tube in the canal, you're measuring the resonance of the whole ear, okay? Outer ear canal, concha, helix, everything. You get your sum total. T is for total. And the T is about over 2,700 hertz, just like it was here. So this slide is simple because a simple guy like me drew it. This slide here is complicated because a researcher did it, okay? But they're telling the same story. And what I want to make sure we realize is manufacturers' first fits by their software, their first fits are a shot in the dark. That's like this guy blindfolded trying to not to hit that person. I mean, real ear measurement verifies the predictions of software in first fits. That's why it's very foolish not to do real ear. Not doing real ear is a lot like me saying, I think you've got cancer without taking a biopsy to prove it. Okay? Uh, we, our science has evolved to where we must and should do real ear measurement. All too often, we let the software do the talking and the walking. So the software is showing you, oh, look, the, the targets, here's the targets, the straighter lines, and here, look, at the, the thin lines are what the hearing aid's doing. And you might have three targets, one for soft inputs, one for loud, one for, you know, whatever, average, and one for loud. Oh, look, it looks really good in the software. <laughs> and when reality would show if this is the hearing loss going up, and this is loudness discomfort levels across the top, and if these plus signs are your target, in between your floor of hearing thresholds and your ceiling of loudness tolerance, your targets nicely in the middle of your dynamic range. Well, looky, looky, the hearing aid isn't coming, is nice and close to target for the low frequencies, but not for the highs, even though the software said it would be. And that's why all too often we let the software do the walking and the talking and we don't always verify with objective measures is the hearing aid doing what we think it's supposed to do. So fitting methods versus reality. Okay, here might be a hearing loss. You may not at all be able to hit target at all. Nonetheless, now let's move on to where things evolve to today. Compression based fitting methods, compression based, not linear based anymore. Now the year is 1995, we've moved into the 90s. Now this is a picture of me some years ago, and I found this book on an airplane called DSL for Dummies. Well, DSL is a, is a computerized thing. It has nothing to do with this formula, okay, with our fitting method. That's why I could find a book like that on the airplane. Nonetheless, I thought it fit because I was just trying to learn DSL myself. And when you look at the logo of DSL, see that logo on, the, on the, that black on the left? See how this bottom line rises really quickly? That might be someone's hearing loss. And it's drawn in DBSPL. DSL was a game changer. DSL got us out of the land of gain and ushered us into a new era. And that new era was output. From now on, output became king because output is what's smashing into your eardrum and is the output what it needs to be, not the gain. So, and then the top line here would be your loudness discomfort level. So they've taken the audiogram and flipped it upside down, and they've put it on an SPLogram. And then here would be your targets for average speech, for louder speech, for softer speech. Now, just came from a different, look at this guy, he's playful. Yeah, mate, want to join me at the corner for a beer? You know, <laughs> looky, looky, I can hear you know, an Aussie, kind of just a, just totally different fitting methods. And they competed with each other for, for years. Now, they aren't so different anymore. Now, they're really quite similar. And we'll describe this. The desired sensation level is the name of the DSL fitting method. And it came, originated early in 1982, but it wasn't known at all. Nobody knew about it at all. And it was a pediatric method meant for babies. 
Later on in the 90s, the software began to focus on compression hearing aids. And it's out of the University of Western Ontario in London, Ontario, Canada. Yeah, London, not London, England. London, Ontario. That's about a city, about 350,000 people. A little bigger than Springfield. It's a decent city. No, not a bad place. Anyways, it's near the city of Toronto, about 120 miles west of Toronto. Anyway, special DSL stuff because this was a game changer. Totally. DSL reads in SPL, not HL. Hearing loss and hearing aids now can speak the same language. DSL reads in output, not gain. Output rules. Gain is just a means to an end. DSL reads in, look, looks at transforms, real ear to coupler difference. Where have we heard that before? They're the ones who came up with that. Okay, MLE, mic location effect. Are you fitting a CIC when the mic is deep in the concha bowl of your ear? Or are you fitting a rick when the mic is on top of your ear? Okay, these make a difference. So DSL was really picky, picky, picky. It really stuck to accuracy. And it, of course, had more than one target. Now, this is important. Linear hearing aids offered one target. Remember that. Stop sharing screen for a second. Linear hearing aids offered one target because linear hearing aids gave the same gain for all input levels. They would give, let's say, for example, 50 dB of gain to a, to a soft input like 10 dB. They'd give 50 dB of gain to a 30 dB SPL input. Here, I'll draw 30. <laughs> okay. They'd give 50 dB of gain to a 50 dB SPL input. They'd give 50 dB of gain to an 80 decibel input. Okay. So it, it, they're going to be given that so the person's always adjusting his volume control on the hearing aid because the gain might be perfectly set for an average input like speech. But for a whisper softly like this, the person would be, have to turn up the aid. And for a loud, loud yelling, the person would have to turn down the aid. Okay? DSL changed that. DSL began to talk about compression. And when you're talking compression, then you're going to show more than one target because compression gives different gain at different inputs. It gives more than half gain at soft inputs and less than half gain for loud inputs. So you're going to show three different targets. Once again, my lovely little screen gets stuck here. This just drives me bonkers with Zoom. I have to, I think I'm going to end up phoning IT and asking them that at the school because that's really, but well, at any rate, let's look for now, let the computer do its thing, and then I'll come back to it. DSL fitting method. Okay. Now, I kind of missed a little thing here about NALRP. But NALR, when we talked about now R, we talked about how it was revised. NALRP was a little wrinkle on it, on now. And what they did was they backed off Jack from giving a lot of gain where there was very little hearing period. In fact, now, now was, but we'll get to that later again. I know I'm looping a bit here. I'm kind of mixing you up, but I just see this on the top of the screen here. And I just, I just thought, I don't know if I really want to miss that or not. If I go, and I don't think I even have it, though. Let's just see. Bear with me here. <clears throat> you won't mind. Hang on here. Da, 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 da. No, I didn't even have it in this, so don't worry about it. We'll, I'm going to be touching base on that later on when we deal with now NL1 and now NL2. So <clears throat> stick to Snickers here. We'll continue on with DSL. Not to worry, not to worry. Yeah, all right. <clears throat> now, DSL reads in SPL, not HL. The audiogram is flipped upside down, or we'll call it right side up. <clears throat> As dBs increase, SPL goes up, hearing loss and hearing aids are now read on the same graph, the ceiling and the floor of hearing are truly shown as the ceiling and the floor, and the audiogram above normal hearing levels and below UCLs, the dynamic range is plainly displayed. 
and it reads in output, not gain. Now think of this, output is the final goods, it's the groceries that is delivered to the doorstep of your eardrum. Input to the mic of the hearing aid plus gain is output. And always remember, input is measured in dBSPL. Gain is a relative thing, just measured in terms of dB. And output is the sum total of input and gain, and it too is measured in dBSPL. So the only outsider here is gain, measured in dB. It's a relative thing because I can give that 50 dB of gain to a soft input, an average input, or a loud input. It's relative. DSL targets are shown as amplified speech output targets, and they, this, this should sit nicely within the dynamic range. And, then, and DSL doesn't like insertion gain. They hated it. And here's why. DSL said, shoot, we're not measuring real ear unaided response when we're doing a hearing test with a headphone because we're plugging up the ear with a headphone when you're doing the hearing test. So now you've obliterated the real ear unaided response. And if you've killed that off, remember, you know, it's no longer an open ear canal. It's no longer a quarter wave resonator because now you've taken that cup and you've closed it off at both ends. You put a hearing aid in it or you put a headphone on top. So when you didn't use real open unaided ear canal resonance during the hearing test, then why the Sam Hill are you using it during the hearing aid test? Okay, so they hated insertion gain. I used to teach at the University of Western Ontario with Richard Seewald, who invented DSL. They used to have a sign with insertion gain, it would have a, you know, like a circle, it would say insertion gain, and it would have a line through it, like you can't go here, or, you know, like, this, like the speed signs in Europe have, you know. It's just like they hated it. it was a, they had a real bee in their bonnet about it. Here's the spl -ogram. Here's a picture of it. Here's normal hearing level shown in dbspl. What would this be? Minimal audible pressure. We're going to pull it up even closer. Let's make sure we understand this. DSL was the game changer. In fact, it changed the game so much that eventually now copied DSL and began to do this too. And then all of real ear changed from insertion gain <laughs> they threw that away. Now we do real ear this way. We, our real ear today looks like this. And it's called real ear aided response. And we don't care about real ear unaided response. And we don't care about real ear insertion gain. It's gone. So you see how a fitting method like DSL affected real ear. So and real ear changed as a result of it. So these things are connected. Real ear and fitting methods are inextricably wound together. But DSL said we need to look at the hearing loss differently. We need to plot it. Look at my vertical axis in decibels SPL. So you've got frequency on the bottom and zero dBHL. Look at my white line. That is zero DBHL. It's the softest it takes to hear all the different tones under a headphone. Minimal audible pressure. And nowhere does it touch zero, does it? This line is all above zero. The only place it would ever touch zero is when you're talking minimal audible field. And that's the softest it takes to hear all the different frequencies at one meter distance from a speaker with two ears. And two ears are better. Two ears are better than one ear. How much better? Several dB better. Therefore, this line, this line, this whole curve would be down at the bottom.
with two ears. But we don't care about that. We're talking about a hearing aid in one ear, and then we're going to measure the hearing aid in the other ear. So we're talking about one ear at a time. So we're talking about minimal audible pressure. So this white curve at the bottom is capital I-S, bold-faced, italics, underline, is 0 dB HL on the audiogram. HL is now turned into SPL. And the thresholds you measured on that audiogram are changed into thresholds in dB SPL automatically on the computer. And then you can see the loudness discomfort levels in asterisks across the top. You can choose average. You can choose measured. Either one. So here's the client's dynamic range. You can see how the dynamic range is reduced from the normal dynamic range. Look at the large dynamic range here. Normal versus impaired. Speech sounds on an audiogram. DSL preserves the loudness relationship. Unlike now, DSL says let's keep that loudness relationship when aiding the person. So DSL is going to give more low frequency amplification than now will. Okay, because normal hearing people hear the vowels louder than the consonants. So basically, that's what now DSL is going to preserve that. Here's the long-term average speech spectrum. Look at how the low frequencies of speech, all your z D, d, all your voiced consonants and vowels are louder and lower than your high frequency consonants, and DSL preserves this relationship. Speech stops and starts rapidly over time, too, doesn't it? Ah, so look at the range of speech loudness, speech intensity. You can see the dots at the top the dots here, and look at the mean or average. It's not in the dead center of the range, is it? It's 12 dB below the top and 18 dB above the bottom. It ain't in the middle, Jack. And that's because speech is not like the intensity of speech it changes rapidly over time, unlike the noise of a fan or the noise of an air conditioner. The intensity of speech rapidly fluctuates. And any time you have a sound where the intensity of rapidly fluctuates over time, your average is not going to be in the center of your loudness range. If this was a fan or an air conditioner, the average would be sitting right in the middle, but with speech, it ain't. And this is how digital noise reduction works in hearing aids. Digital noise reduction in hearing aids capitalizes on this statistical finding right here. It uses it all the time. It's very careful to point that out. And that's how digital noise reduction works. If the mean intensity is not in the center of the loud, the softest and the loudest, if it's not in its rate, not in the middle of its range, it says, hey, it must be noise. Reduce the gain. And if the sound coming into the hearing aid wubble, 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 pop, 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 changes rapidly over time, the hearing aid goes, ah, look at that. The mean is not in the center of the range. It must be speech. Amplify the crap out of it. <laughs> Digital noise reduction. I digress, but nonetheless, these things match a bit. So speech is a weird sound. Look at this bell curve here. The bell curve, just like grading on a curve. Look at this. You can think of this as how many students got A's? Look at my cursor. How many got B's? How many got C's? And how many got D's? So the this would be the grade here, and the vertical is the number of students who got those grades. And most students got Bs, you know, B minus, C plus. And very few students got As, and very few students got Ds. A bell curve, okay? Statistics. Noise reduction, I should say speech, look at its 
bell curve. It's, it has a very odd distribution. It's all over the place. So the number of times that speech is actually at some particular intensity is all over the place. This story here is telling the same as this story here. Okay, very same thing, just telling it in another way. This is showing the actual spectrum, the long-term average speech spectrum, L-T-A-S-S, -S, LTAS, okay? More energy in the lows, less in the highs. The dotted lines show the range from the loudest to the softest. The solid is the mean in the middle, okay? This is just showing you distributions, how many times, percent of times, that it was the intensity at some particular intensity. And noise of a fan or air conditioner will be show that most of the time it's at some particular intensity. But with speech, that's really hard to show. And that's what digital noise reduction seizes upon. Here's another way of looking at the same thing. Noise is steady in intensity. Okay, this is a pure tone, but you know what I mean. Okay, speech, the waveform is same story. I'm just telling the same thing, different slides. Okay, this shows the how much the sound changes in intensity over time. Anyway, that's another topic. The DSL goal, raise speech into the auditory area. In other words, put speech into the listener's dynamic range. Put it there. Long-term average speech spectrum basically refers to unaided speech. Okay, long-term average speech spectrum. That's this. This. Okay, long-term average speech spectrum. Basically, the audibility of unaided speech is DSL's main focus. The SPLogram shows unaided and aided speech. Look at that, unaided speech and unaided thresholds. And then you can also see aided speech. Now, doesn't that make for a great counseling tool? I think so. Heck of a counseling tool. <coughs> Much better than since something like this, for example. I'll go up here. We got time. Not a problem. Much better than doing something stupid like this. Well, where is it? Now we'll go higher up here. Okay, Ted, let's see if you can find that guy. Much better than doing this. What does this tell anybody? Well, I can see that your insertion gain is very closely matched to target. Where's the audiogram? Where's the beef? What can you, how is this going to explain to a parent, a teacher, a loved one, what the benefit of the hearing aid is in terms of everyday life? The answer is it doesn't. It's not a very good counseling tool. A much better counseling tool would be to say, say this. Here's what your person could hear before we put the hearing aids on. Look at this. Here's the hearing loss. Here's normal hearing on the bottom. Here's your hearing loss. And here's speech, LTAS. This is what you could hear without the hearing aids. What did you hear? Just the lows. Didn't hear much of the highs at all. You just heard. Okay. When I'm aid with hearing aids, we're lifting that up where it belongs. Okay, you're, now you're aided speech versus unaided speech. And you can counsel the client and show the benefit of the hearing aid visually and literally because you are mapping speech onto his dynamic range. And that's what today's real ear does, speech mapping. So you can think of three chapters, functional gain in the old days with linear hearing aids, then still linear hearing aids, but real ear measurement came out. And so instead of using functional gain, you're using insertion gain. And with functional gain, you might have been using half gain rule, burger, Libby, Pogo, now, now R. And then with insertion gain, you might have been using half gain, Libby, Pogo, now, now R, doesn't matter. 
Then came DSL, and with it came speech mapping. And now we are looking at in situ output. Write those words down. In situ, I N in situ, S I T U, in situation, in place, amplification, in situ, aided response, in situ output. In situ, with the hearing aid in situation, what's the output? And when, when you're comparing that to old real ear, basically all we care about is real ear aided response. R-E-A-R, -E real ear aided response. And to highlight that, I'm just going to make sure we loop back and see it. It's important. We've got time here. In terms of the old real ear, all we care about is this blue line because that's what was measured with the tube in place and the hearing aid on top of it, in situ aided output. That's the only thing we care about. We don't care about this, we don't care about that, we don't care about the red, nuh -uh, who cares, leave it alone. We're taking this blue and we're saying, how does it fit on to the client's residual dynamic range? How does that fit? Does it work? Okay, here's the targets. The plus signs are situated between the client's floor and the client's ceiling. This is the client's dynamic range. And your object is to make aided outputs rest nicely and comfortably on the listener's dynamic range and at the DSL targets. So, unaided response, aided response. Okay, unaided, and we'll go over to here. We've talked about unaided speech has that 30 dB dynamic range, 12 dB, you know, 18 dB below. Okay, so basically, speech intensity is very unevenly distributed over time, but nonetheless, it's looking at placing long-term average speech spectrum, whatever that is, the fact that it fluctuates, who cares? You can see its range, though. See the top? See the bottom, it's 30 dB deep, and the, the, the mean is situated not quite in the center, 12 dB below the top, 18 dB above the bottom, there it sits, okay? Your object with DSL is to raise this to the DSL targets. That's the essence. Same thing now is available on most real ear measurement equipment. And this is a, from today's real ear. The equipment doesn't matter. Most real ear equipment does very similar things. Here's normal hearing in 0 dBHL, plotted in SPL. This is now they call it the speech map. Here's the person's thresholds. Here's the person's loudness tolerance levels. Here's the targets. Okay. And what you want to do is lift this long-term average speech spectrum, this gray mass, you want to lift it so that the mean, follow my cursor, is situated along the targets. And that's how DSL changed everything. Real ear to coupler difference was another thing about DSL. Okay, so first they Flipped the audiogram right side up. They plotted things in DBSPL. So now hearing aids and hearing loss are reading the same thing in the same language. And the third big thing was, excuse me, transforms real ear to coupler difference. What's the difference between what a hearing aid is going to do in your ear versus what it would do in a closed 2CC coupler? This was a big time component of the DSL fitting method. It's what we looked at a few weeks ago with ANSI testing. And ANSI testing involves real ear to coupler difference. Well, I highlighted that because I wanted to show you how that's used in a fitting method today. So what DSL does is, remember what we said about real ear to coupler difference. The sound in a 2CC coupler, Okay, a 2cc coupler is 
two cc's, well, this is a cup, but to pretend this is, holds two cubic centimeters, okay? The closed ear canal with a hearing aid in it is smaller than two cc's. It's about one to one and a half. So if the sound is 70 dB SPL in a 2cc coupler, you take that same sound and you put it into a closed ear canal with a hearing aid on top, that sound will be more than 70. Why? Because the room is smaller. Therefore, that's real ear to coupler difference. And what did we say that was? We said it was about 5 dB below 1,000 hertz and about 10 dB above 1,000 hertz. The, real, the 2cc coupler underestimates what the hearing aid is going to be doing in the ear. So when you put a hearing aid on a 2cc coupler and you measure the frequency response, if you add about 5 dB to that below 1,000 hertz and add about 10 dB to that above 1,000 hertz, you'll get a pretty close idea as to what the hearing aid's going to do in an average adult ear canal. So what DSL allows you to do is to choose an average real ear to coupler difference, which, they've, which is in the computer, or maybe the person's a big guy, has large ear canals, or maybe the person's a little kid and has little ear canals. So if, or maybe the person's had mastoid surgery, so his whole ear canal is different. So if you see a different looking ear canal, DSL advises measure the real ear to coupler difference. And RECD is very easy to measure on real ear. It takes about 30 seconds to do. You take, take the hearing aid and the 2cc coupler, okay, broop, put the hearing aid in, in, in the ear, plug it with a foam ear plug, broop, done. If the, the computer just calculates it and sticks it into the uh, formula. Anyway. Real ear to coupler difference is really the ear print of your client. If you had a child who doesn't want to sit still for real ear measurements all day, that kid is fidgety and is fussing all over the place, quickly measure his RECD. Send the kid home. Put the hearing aid on a 2cc coupler. Factor in his RECD, and you'll know exactly what it'll do in his ear. And that's called simulated real ear measurement, SREM. That's another thing DSL brought to the table, okay? Remember, it began as a pediatric-based fitting method. So you'd take the hearing aid, you'd put it on a 2cc coupler, factor in the RECD, and now try to hit targets on your DSL method. Once you have, call up the parent, okay, come on in, bring your kid in. I'll fit the hearing aids now. SREM. Pretty genius. I mean, they just, they had it. Mic location effect. Remember, where's the location of the mic? Is it, in a CI, is it in a CIC, which is buried inside the concha, which gets the added advantage of the resonance of the concha bowl? Or is it a rick when the mic is on top and doesn't get the benefit of the added concha bowl resonance? So all of these things, DSL had a real persnickety hankering for accuracy. It was big time on the accuracy front. And a fourth thing about DSL is it had more than one target because it addressed compression. And let's memorize what are soft, average, and loud levels so that we can memorize what these targets represent. A target for soft inputs would be 50 dB SPL, okay, soft. In HL, it's probably like 40, 45, okay. Average inputs, 65 to 70 because that's average speech. And loud inputs around 90, 50, 70, 90. You can change this. You could say this 50, 65, 85. That's okay too. Both of those answers are correct. Doesn't matter, but get a basic grip as to what soft, average, and loud actually represent in dBSPL. 50, 55 ish, 65, 70 ish, 85 ish, 90 ish. Okay, soft, average, loud. Very important. So, more than one target. Here's the guy's hearing loss. 
here might be three different targets. A target for soft inputs, a target for average inputs, a target for loud inputs. And let's work this out together before we close today. I know I didn't get done today at all. I don't care. Doesn't matter. We're going to finish this off next week with NAL NL1, NAL NL2, and how do they compare to DSL. But these are fundamental things we need to grasp in order to really understand real ear and where we're going with it. Okay? So bear with me here. Look at a thousand hertz. And look at these inputs, 50, 70, 90. Okay, the bottom one here is for a 50 dB input. What's the output here? Well, it's about 75 at 1,000 hertz. Look at 1,000 hertz. What's the output here? 75. What's 75 minus an input of 50? That's a gain of 25. Now let's look at average inputs. What's my, what's my output here? It's at 1,000 hertz, it's, it's going to be about oh, 75, 80, 85, it's about 85. What's 85 minus 70? That's about 15. So my gain went down. Loud inputs. What's my output for loud inputs? 95-ish? Huh. Output of 95 for an input of 90, what's my gain? 95 minus 90, 5. So look at how my gain changed. 25 dB of gain for 50 inputs, 15 dB of gain for 70 inputs, 5 dB of gain for 90 dB inputs. So that's showing compression. Compression is taking place here. Three different targets for one loss. Why? Because compression gives different gain at different inputs. Oh, and here's just a close-up of exactly what we talked about. I could have showed you here the very same thing. So this slide is just a close-up. But make sure that you understand it. You look at this and internalize it, okay? And notice how with output, the top line represents the greatest input. And the bottom line represents the softest input. This is opposite to how gain is read. And we'll talk about that when we look at now next week. Old DSL prescribed lots of gain and output compared to other fitting methods. It's a reputation it still has, even though later versions have reduced things. Okay, it's a reputation it's still got. It prescribed a lot of gain and output compared to other fitting methods. And here's a close-up example. Oh, yeah, you could hit targets, with D but look at the DSL targets for the highs. Most hearing aids of the day couldn't hit the high-frequency DSL targets if they paid for it. They couldn't. That was a reputation they had. Now, here's a picture of Richard Seawald in Canada. He's an American, by the way. I believe he's from, uh, I think he's from uh, Connecticut or something like that, New York State. Anyway, he lives now in Canada. And look at how he killed off DSL version 4. He shot that person. He put him out of his misery. Richard Seawald, PhD, shows he has killed off the old DSL. Why? Because it provided too much output and gain. And so it has merged and evolved into a different creature today. And we will talk about that more next week when we talk about DSL version 5 versus DSL version 4. And next week we will also talk about NAL NL1, and that stands for NAL, National Acoustics Labs, nonlinear compression, version 1, versus NAL nonlinear version 2. And today, the main two players today, actually there's three sort of, NAL1, NAL2, and DSL5. And now one is fading, and you've really got two main fitting methods out there today, NAL2 and DSL5. Those versions are actually so close together, it's unreal. I'll just give you a preview. 
you're not going to believe this. But, you know, the preview is this. Just I'll show you how similar these fitting methods can be. It's unbelievable. <clears throat> Excuse me. Look at this. Here is DSL-5. Look at the targets for DSL-5. Here's the hearing loss. Here's UCLs or loudness discomfort levels. Here's targets for DSL-5. See how they're no, they're no longer in the middle anymore? They've been reduced a bit. And here's targets for NAL2. NAL2 targets, don't worry about this big green thing. That's just LTAS. That's unaided speech, by the way. BTW, long-term average unaided speech, okay? Long-term average speech spectrum. So just leave that out. But look at the little cross marks. These are the targets for NAL2 for this hearing loss. Here's the targets for DSL for that same hearing loss. NAL2, DSL5. NAL2, DSL5. A man on a flying horse would be hard pressed to recognize the difference, wouldn't he? Enough for this week. We'll stop sharing. Hope you uh, have a good weekend. Digest this all. But I'm, before the weekend is out, I'm going to end up talking to you in your lab session at, I believe it's 3.30 Friday, February 24, Central Standard Time. I'm going to be not in this room either. I'm going to be talking to you out of a motel room in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Hope the Internet's good. See you when we look at you. Ciao for now.